Hi everyone, before we get started, I just want to make a super quick appeal. If you enjoy this podcast and you think it's important that this podcast is available to listeners around the world, then please do us a huge favor and contribute whatever you can to support the Young Institute. Um, it includes this podcast, of course, and also the uh, programs we have um, online and in person, which are made affordable, of course, as you can imagine, as a nonprofit, it costs more to uh, run the programs than we really feel is appropriate to charge everyone who would like to attend. Um, because of that, we need support to make sure that all of this is available. And that includes this absolutely free podcast, which is about to hit 1 million downloads, probably sometime in January. Um, and it's listened to by thousands of people around the world in over 100 countries. And so if you want this resource to continue to be available, if you think it's important and you value its position in your life and in others, please consider supporting the Institute by clicking the link in the show notes or going to youngchicago.org slash give. Thank you so much. Hello and welcome to episode 5 of Jungian Ever After, a podcast about fairy tales through the lens of Jungian analysis. I am your host, Raisa, and joining me as always is my co-host and Jungian analyst, Dr. Adina Davidson. Are you excited for today's episode? I am. I We're going to be talking about one of the most powerful and interesting archetypes and it's an archetype that you and I have been following and thinking about, again, since we watched Once Upon a Time together for so many seasons. Yeah, I think we kind of cheated on our formula. Not that we've been around long enough to really have a formula yet. Just to fit this in, because we love the trickster archetype so much. So today we're going to do things a little bit differently in that while we still discuss some of the parts of the Rumpelstiltskin story, we're going to be combining it with discussion regarding a more general archetype, the trickster archetype. We touched on this briefly in the last episode, but Rumpelstiltskin is very much a trickster story. So, Adina, why don't you tell us a bit about the trickster archetype? I want to start by giving honor and respect to Judith Cooper, who is one of my teachers and supervisors and mentors, and probably the person that I learned the most about the trickster archetype from. She describes the trickster as, a, first of all, a change agent. Trickster upends, changes, disrupts, or destroys outmoded systems. Jung, in his essay on the trickster, says he reverses the normal hierarchy. And Jung cites the example of Carnival in Europe, New Orleans, and Rio, and says they're great examples of trickster rituals. In Carnival, night becomes day, play becomes work, male and female become fluid and interchangeable, sexual norms are upended, and normal power dynamics are no longer enforced. And I think maybe if we think about the Mardi Gras or Carnival that we're probably in the United States most familiar with in New Orleans, and we put ourselves back 50, 60, 70 years ago, we can really see this happening, right? First of all, everybody stays up, including right up till now. You're like your day starts at 5 p.m. and ends at 5 or 6 or 7 a.m. And you sleep during the day and you're awake during the night. So night becomes day. Play becomes work. The work that goes into creating the floats and the festival is enormous. So something that is unpaid, is just for the joy of it, becomes people's primary work for Mardi Gras season. Male and female, fluid and interchangeable, I think that speaks for itself. Sexual norms are upended. I don't know how many of our listeners have been to Mardi Gras, 
but women walk around topless just constantly on city streets. Women are constantly showing their breasts in exchange for Mardi Gras beads, completely worthless Mardi Gras beads to people they don't know from a hole in the wall. Men are showing their bare bottoms in the same kind of way. So any kind of norms of privacy or modesty or anything that we sort of think of as good behavior in public, out the window. Sure. Sort of social contract. <laughs> just gone. And really not just the sexual social contract, but a lot of it is just gone for that Mardi Gras period. And normal power dynamics are no longer enforced. I think this can be seen more strongly in the past when racial power dynamics were particularly strong. So African-Americans and white people were more or less an equal power footing when it came to Mardi Gras. Really? Yeah, the, the black floats and teams were just as valued, or at least close to just as valued, as the white teams and floats. I think we can see all of this happening in our own big version of Carnival. Did you have any questions or thoughts about that, Raisa, before I keep blathering on? <laughs> well, I've never been to Carnivale or anything. I, I remember watching the film Casanova, Mm, uh, which mm -hmm. is uh, about someone who uh, b breaks those uh, sexual norms, I suppose, <laughs> and is is just very r rampant around. I forget if it's actually Rome, but it's it's around Carnevale, mm, um, mm -hmm. and so the church is after him. Mm -hmm. And I think actually in Europe, and again, I'm speaking a little bit outside of my, well, maybe a lot outside my area of expertise. But my understanding is that the church sort of just threw up its hands, basically, in Europe mm. and didn't enforce its normal rules, generally. Because how could you just lock everyone up or, or whatever? I, I think probably that and also maybe from an intuitive sense that Human psyche needs these times where we turn everything upside down or we sort of, you know, die a little bit. Like it re-energizes something crucial inside of us. Yeah, it, it's sort of a more harmless or certainly at least less harmful version of a purge. Have you heard of this? It no. It came about as a term because of a horror film, I think, called okay. The Purge. And the premise was basically that it was a totally ordered, peaceful, whatever, society. But one day a year, there was the purge, where it was just all the rules were gone. But it was from the standpoint of, like, a murdering people. So people would go out and just commit horrendous acts of violence. And most other people who weren't wanting to do that just tried to hide. and make it through, and then go back to their ordered society. So I think this is kind of similar to that, except because it's a ritual, it is much more manageable. It's much more contained. Murder or assault are not condoned, but the overturning of sexual mores, racial stereotypes, power dynamics, that is all part of it. So Jung says Mardi Gras and Carnival turn everything upside down. And in doing so, they allow older levels of consciousness to let itself rip with all of the wildness, wantonness, and irresponsibility. Second aspect of Trickster. So the first aspect was that it's a change agent and that it upends things. Second aspect is Trickster's a rule breaker. Trickster challenges the status quo. Third is that Trickster brings chaos, instability, and surprise. Fourth is that Trickster is a shapeshifter. He has a dual nature, male and female at once, half animal, half divine, 
And sometimes in that animal divine mix, also a savior figure. Trickster is subversive. If she's not funny, she's not a trickster. I think this is really important. Trickster has humor. It might be cruel humor, but it's humor. She mocks herself and she mocks the power structure. In many stories, Trickster is the messenger of the gods. So Hermes is a trickster figure who brings knowledge from the gods that people need. And she's also a guide between the realms. Trickster helps us navigate between conscious life and unconscious life. And finally, she helps us understand paradox, something that seems completely contradictory as psychological truth. Yeah, I think before you told me, I didn't really think of the messenger of Hermes as being a trickster character. I just thought, oh, you know, this very interesting kind of, in a lot of ways, supporting role in so many stories mm -hmm. goes with Zeus in disguise in Baucis and Philemon, is part of the Orpheus and Eurydice story where he's the one who's walking Eurydice out and has to make sure that Orpheus doesn't look behind him. Right. Of course, always bringing messages. He's the messenger god to all of these people in the Iliad or, or whatever. But I never really thought of Hermes as a, a trickster until you brought it up to my attention. Right. But he starts out his career by stealing Apollo's cattle. Very <laughs> tricksterish, right? He's a brand uh -huh. new baby and he's already stealing the god's cows. <laughs> yep, yep. The tricksters that I'm more familiar with are from pop culture. I think the most popular one is, of course, Loki uh, from Norse myth, but also the current Marvel Cinematic Universe. Loki has always been a, a very beloved character to a certain group of fans. And I think the Loki show was one of the better pieces of Marvel content, particularly regarding the the shows that they've been doing, uh, it was a time. I don't I don't know if I want to say travel, but kind of travel uh, story. But it was also just very much this trickster story, and, and like focusing on the trickster and you know light spoilers. There are many Lokis. <laughs> it's, it's it's the whole multiversal thing. So yeah, you get to see. The trickster in all these various forms, some comical, some very serious, and that was very enjoyable. But also, they're animal Lokis, they're, maybe this is more of a spoiler, sorry, everybody, <laughs> but they're animal Lokis, they're female Lokis, all of that stuff that we talked about, about the shape-shifting, is very apparent Yes. In the series. Yeah, absolutely. You, you sort of almost never know, ooh, is this figure, is this character going to turn out to be a Loki? Right. Maybe. Which is, again, that wondering that, ooh, where is Trickster going to jump out at us is very much part of the archetype. And even outside of the show, but in the films, etc., it shape shifts all the time. Shows up and pretends to be one of the Avengers or transforms just to mess with people to turn into someone that they care about. Very classic stuff. And they reference some Norse stories when it comes to Loki's childhood with Thor. Get a kick out of some of those. When you and I were talking about developing this particular episode, you pointed out a really important difference between Loki in Norse mythology and Loki in the Marvel Universe. And I wonder if you wanted to talk about that. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, Loki in the Norse mythology is much more dark, I think. You know, he ultimately is punished very severely. I believe there's venom dripping constantly into his eyes and keeps having his 
liver or something eaten by this some kind of large bird but like it always grows back i forget what the offense was that triggered that but he's also the herald of ragnarok so when loki gets out ragnarok is going to start the world serpent is going to devour midgard which is the earth well i guess maybe it's supposed to devour the whole of yggdrasil yeah i think the universe as we know it yeah and then Thor is supposed to fight Loki in Ragnarok. So in mythology, Loki brings Armageddon, brings the end of everything we know and love. And I think this kind of segues me into one of the most important insights that I've learned about Trickster. Is she's always powerful, but she is at her most dangerous, most thoughtless, and most cruel when she is unconscious. So when we can become aware of trickster energy in us, when we can bring it into consciousness, it is always, always powerful and pretty much always dangerous. But we don't have to be thoughtless and cruel because it's always upending the status quo. So that is dangerous by definition. But it doesn't have to be Armageddon if we can be or our own personal Armageddon, if we can be conscious of it. I mean, you can even think about this in terms of comedy. I mean, comedy is very subjective generally. Different people find different things funny, and it can be cultural difference, etc. But how many times have you encountered someone where they make a joke, and it just falls flat on the crowd they're in? Like, it's just offensive, and is taken the wrong way. People get upset and they're like, what? It was, it was just a joke, right? Because they, they weren't thinking about it. But then you consider something like some late night comedy shows. I think in general, late night comedy shows, they're much more scripted. There's a lot more forethought into it. They won't try and offend anyone too badly unless they're like, okay, we can handle this or we aren't worried about offending this person. You know, the way I think about that, and it was really a moment when somebody described this to me, it's not funny if you're punching down. Right. It's funny if you're punching up. But if you are unconscious that you are punching down, if you are unaware of, say, racism, homophobia, transphobia, you're not going to realize you are punching somebody with less power than you. And you and your audience, who are also unconscious, will find it funny. And as we grow in consciousness, what we find funny changes and becomes less cruel. So as Trickster becomes more conscious, she remains a change agent. She continues to upend the old order, either our internal order or the external order. But he loses his unthinking cruelty. And he has the potential to become, as Jung says, the wounded wounder is the agent of healing and the sufferer that takes away suffering. So I think, really, if you think about comedians again, they are often wounded. When they play this role of critiquing the social order as it is, they can be an agent of healing, of creating change of moving us towards something better. They are often making comedy out of their own suffering that helps us take away our suffering in the laughter. Yeah, I think throughout the past couple of years, there was definitely a period where, you know, okay, I got some news from the Daily New York Times podcast, but I also relied on John Oliver and Stephen Colbert and mm -hmm. Trevor Noah because... I want to know what's happening, but I need it delivered in this way that is, is palatable and not going to make me totally doom and gloom. And, you know, they do get serious at times, but it is broken up with some levity. And in terms of the agent of healing, HBO has a lot of budget for last week tonight for John Oliver. And sometimes he spends it sort of wantonly on just things that strike his fancy, but sometimes he's able to implement some real good and change uh, may result in further comedy, such as, I, I remember, I mean, this was a while back, but he did something to 
help uh, the koalas in Australia because they were getting chlamydia and it was a big problem for the continuation of the species. So they like raised a bunch of money and they, they named they named it the John Oliver Chlamydia Award. <laughs> And even if we go a little farther back into history, I think of Charlie Chaplin mocking Adolf Hitler. Mm. Right? I mean, and he he was trying to show the world what a little, little person Hitler really was. Didn't succeed, but it was a very valiant trickster attempt. Uh huh. <laughs> so. We started the show by saying that Rumpelstiltskin can be seen as a trickster story. And I've always assumed that it was Rumpelstiltskin himself who was the trickster. But as I read through it again in preparation for this episode, I actually think it's the Miller's daughter. I've tended, and I think this is partly because of my own lens of seeing through things through patriarchy. So she's a girl. So she's the hapless victim. And that's how I always saw her. But in fact, she uses trickster energy to get what she needs throughout the story. And she becomes more and more effective at it. She starts the tale seeming really, truly helpless. She's given by her father to a king. She doesn't even speak up to object. And threatened with death if she does not do the impossible task of spinning straw into gold. And then she just sits there and weeps. There's no trickster there. There's just a victim. Then in walks Rumpelstiltskin, who can magically turn straw into gold. He makes a deal. In exchange for increasingly valuable items, he will save her life. Nothing seems terribly tricky here either. Just a simple barter. You give me jewelry and eventually your unborn child. I will make straw into gold. You stay alive. I think I see where you're going here in terms of her turning trickster at the end of the story. But I think I kind of want to disagree on like her being the main trickster. Maybe you could argue that it sort of is a transference from Rumpelstiltskin to the Miller's daughter. But ultimately... The story is named for Rumpelstiltskin. And in a way, I guess the story is tricking the reader about who's the main character since we empathize with the Miller's daughter, but she remains nameless. I mean, we have to say the Miller's daughter. But part of being a trickster is the fall as mm -hmm. well. And we get Rumpelstiltskin's demise at the end of the story, but we get more of the Miller daughter's rise. So being a trickster tends to go hand in hand with hubris. And that's sort of what gets Rumpelstiltskin in the end. Totally true. Point taken. He definitely, his hubris really is his undoing. And that is a very, I mean, real briefly, if we think about the coyote stories and him taking his eyes out one more time than he was told he could, and then he loses them permanently. Coyote always gets in trouble for hubris. That is classic. And, and that isn't in the Rumpelstiltskin story. But I still think that the Miller's daughter finds her trickster energy and uses it. One place we see Trickster entering the story is the point where Rumpelstiltskin arrives to take the queen, or the miller's daughter, to take her first child. And she realizes the horrible bargain she has unconsciously made. When she agreed to give up her firstborn, she did not know what this meant. But now she has a real live baby who she will do anything to protect. This ferocious maternal love creates an opening in her psyche for Trickster to come in and to develop. And Rumpelstiltskin begins to be tricked. Instead of insisting on the letter of the deal, as you point out, he gets cocky. His hubris takes over. He says, believing that the queen is still a foolish young girl, that if she can guess his name in three days, he will allow her to keep her child. So 
fun. I think in addition to the hubris thing, this kind of goes back to what you were saying about the unconscious versus the conscious trickster. When he was making these deals, I think even for him, it was this thing in the future, oh, ha, I'll get your, your firstborn child. But we know that if he can spin straw into gold, he doesn't really care about wealth. So those first objects that he takes, a ring and a necklace, something like that, I mean, I don't even remember, it's so inconsequential. He's doing it just because they're valuable to her, not because it really has value to him. So then when she's queen and has wealth, well, the thing that has value still is her child. Priceless. But he's still, when he comes to claim the child, now that it's conscious, it's like made real, he feels bad, bad enough to give her a way out, except he fails to notice that while he's dealing with the same person, she has many new resources at her disposal besides wealth, you know, she's got influence and people at her command. But he wants to be seen as giving her a chance without actually doing so. Because, I mean, we see this with Loki, too. At, at least in the Marvel, he doesn't want to be seen as a, a villain exactly. He just wants to be noticed and be important and be loved, right? Right. A straight-up villain is not a trickster. Yeah. A straight-up villain is just terrifying and evil and hurts people for the sake of hurting people. As you point out, trickster does what trickster does, whether it hurts people or not, for the sake of being noticed. Fundamentally, though, for the sake of change. And I think that's what we see in the Miller's daughter is trickster changing her. She moves from being powerless and helpless and without any agency of her own into something very different. So the Miller's daughter, she is now the queen, begins her search for Rumpelstiltskin's name in a very rational way. She sends out messengers, as you said, her resources, to find out Rumpelstiltskin's name. This fails. R rationality is not ever an effective tactic with Trickster. But once again, Trickster intervenes. The messenger that she sent comes to a place where everything is upside down. Trickster's home country, where the fox and the rabbit live in harmony. And there, Rumpelstiltskin is reveling in his own cleverness. He's dancing around a fire, singing a silly song that ends with the line that Rumpelstiltskin, I am styled. Of course, the messenger hears the song and brings the name back to the queen. And now Trickster is really in play. The one who was powerless, the poor Miller's daughter, the one who was given to the cruel king, who could not save herself or her child, is now the queen, and she has all the cards. Yeah, I think whether intended or not, it makes for a very different read to sort of go back through the story looking at the Miller's daughter as the trickster. Because when you think about it, she's always the one to gain. I mean, yeah, she has to give away a few objects of value from a desperate situation. That we don't really know. They don't say how sentimental or not the necklace and ring were. But then she has all this vast wealth as queen, whereas Rumpel's like I mentioned earlier, what does he really gain from this? It sounds like he's maybe going to eat the baby, which is pretty dark. <laughs> yes. Maybe I'm misremembering that part of the song, but it seemed maybe like that. But it's sort of like he values the game itself more than anything else. You know, unless we want to th think that his ultimate goal was her baby in the first place. But it, it seems to me that he just sort of scales up the stakes based on what will be most valuable with who he's dealing with. And like a gambling addict, he just wants to keep playing. So that's another reason why he's okay with renegotiating the deal when he comes to take the child, because it's sort of like, well... One more game. I wonder if we can see the Miller's daughter and Rumpelstiltskin as unconscious versus conscious tricksters. 
and mm. what the different results are, right? Rumpelstiltskin remains completely unconscious. As you say, he doesn't have a motivation for change or growth. He just wants to keep playing the game. He just wants to keep playing, right? Very tricksterish and does create change. The Miller's daughter, on the other hand, moves from complete unconsciousness of her own possible power and agency into an adult woman who not only can protect herself, but who can also protect her child, but who uses trickster energy to do so. I agree that Rumpelstiltskin just wants to play the game until he can't anymore and it, at his hubris trips him up. So it's at this point with the queen knowing the name, knowing Rumpelstiltskin's name, that the surprise, the turning upside down of the established order becomes complete. The poor, pathetic Miller's daughter is revealed to be a trickster. She, somewhat cruelly, in true tricksterish fashion, teases Rumpelstiltskin. She pretends to guess his name wrong. Is it Conrad? No. Is it Harry? No. And then she reveals that she knows Rumpelstiltskin's true name. The powerless girl has become the woman with all the power. The magical creature who had the power of life and death over the miller's daughter and then over her child is stripped of all of his power and destroys himself. I was left to wonder, what will the queen do as she comes into all of this power? What changes might she bring to the kingdom? Yeah, and I think it's part of that whole unconscious, conscious thing. We can see how the unconscious trickster is cruel. She finally has one up on him and wants to revel in that. And she's not really thinking about what he's going to do. You know, I, I don't know that she would necessarily have reason to hate Rumpel still is going to hear. I mean, is an antagonist is going to take the child, but he hasn't yet. He gave her this extra chance. And it's one thing to not want your child taken away. It's another thing to have the person who's going to do that tear themselves in half. You know, I'm not sure she quite thought of what was going to happen by winning this game, but I can't imagine it was Rumpelstiltskin's death in such a peculiar fashion. But she doesn't care what the response is going to be. It's just finally she has the opportunity to mess with him, and so she does so. And I think that, first of all, I think both you and I have said we find the ending of this story sort of weird and a little disappointing. Weird, a little disappointing, really gross. Like, if you read the sentence, you're sort of like, I don't even want to think about how that works. Right, how that rending apart. Mm -hmm. Ugh, right. So what about this weird, disconcerting ending relates to Trickster? How does it bring us back to this archetype? We could see it as sort of a transference of that trickster energy from Rumpelstiltskin to the Miller's daughter. Almost a Highlander thing. There can only be one, right? Mm, it sort of passes mm -hmm. on. You could also see it as maybe going from unconscious to more conscious. Yeah. I, I also am just thinking the way it leaves us with so many unanswered questions. I think so many fairy tales end with a pretty neat ending, right? The prince marries the princess, or the person who becomes the princess, happily ever after. This is definitely not that. This is a, what? And we have no <laughs> idea what's going to... There is no happily ever after. There is no, what is... There's no tying it up in a neat little bow. And maybe that, as a trickster tale, maybe that's part of the point. That we're left feeling open-ended and disconcerted. Yeah. You could assume a sort of happily ever after thing. Like, oh, well, now she's with this prince, right? She is, or 
king. You know, she is the queen and has definitely risen up. There, there might be a happily ever after there. There might be, but we still have this uncomfortable cruelty that she showed to Rumpelstiltskin. So what kind of queen is she really going to be? We just yeah. don't really have any of the answers, you know? And we mentioned before regarding once how Rumpelstiltskin is this character that's used to tie together so many of the different stories in that show. And so to read this sort of story about him where he dies in this peculiar fashion at the end, it's sort of, what a waste. What a waste of a trickster character. Right. I think that's something that both you and I, especially after watching Rumpelstiltskin season after season, bring such, both such being the change agent, but also Rumpelstiltskin was the cayenne pepper in <laughs> Once Upon a Time stories. Yeah. And we've just both loved him so much, right? We Like any time he was going to appear, we both were like, ooh, here comes Rumpelstiltskin. What's going to happen <laughs> what? next? <laughs> What's he going to do? What deal is he going to offer? Exactly. And how is it going to get screwed up either for him or for the person taking the deal? And for him to just sort of end this way, I think for both of us felt like, well, yeah, wait, wait a minute. There's so much more that could happen with this. And I think that's where your idea raises it, that maybe Trickster gets transferred to the, to the Miller's daughter or to the queen is an interesting one because that allows the story to continue. Mm -hmm. Hopefully with a little more thinking about what she is doing, but you know. Again, with multiple trickster tales that many of them are come in many, many parts, there is that growth in consciousness. And so I think, yeah, I think this story gives us reason to hope that trickster energy has transferred to place where there is more consciousness but again it's still trickster so you never know <laughs> yeah I, I almost wonder because I, I think Grimm were pretty German Christian values so I almost wonder if this sort of ending by them is intended to be a look don't be like trickster Mm hmm. But unconsciously, they still had Trickster continuing because maybe even without the Grimm brothers noticing, the Miller's daughter takes on the Trickster energy. So, yeah, I mean, I guess that wraps it up for part two. But we wanted to end on this quote that you found from Trickster Makes This World Mischief, Myth and Art by Lewis Hyde. As we think it does a pretty good job of summarizing the archetype. Uh, for those of you familiar with internet speak, you know, it's a trickster TLDR of sorts. So trickster is the lord of the in-between. Trickster does not live near the hearth. He does not live in the halls of justice, the soldier's tent, the shaman's hut, the monastery. He passes through each of these when there is a moment of silence, and he enlivens each with mischief, but he is not their guiding spirit. He is the spirit of the doorway leading out, and of the crossroad at the edge of town. He is the spirit of the road at dusk, the one that runs from one town to another and belongs to neither. That concludes this episode. Our intro-outro music is a sample of Spring Movement One Allegro from The Four Seasons, composed by Antonio Vivaldi and performed by John Harrison and the Wichita State University Players. You can find the full version at freemusicarchive.org, link in the show notes. If you like what you've been hearing, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your podcast feed of choice. It really helps other people find the show. The show will always be free and available to all, but if you would like to monetarily support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash Also. Dr. Adina Davidson is a certified Jungian analyst who offers telesessions. You can find out more about her practice at adinadavidson.com or her Psychology Today profile. We'll be with you again next month, but until then, we hope your month is filled with exploring the worlds of imagination 
and storytelling. Thank you.